Welcome to the podcast, Trisha Martineau Wagner. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. And nothing makes me happier than to talk about the men and women that I've written about because it brings them back to life. Tell us how it is you became so interested in the issue or in the subject, rather, of African Americans in the Old West. Well, when I wrote my first book, which is called It Happened on the Oregon Trail, I found very little research on African Americans that were available. In fact, the first book has 29 stories. Only one of them is about Native American, two about uh, African Americans, and 26. The rest are all about white people. I'm like, where is the research and the history of black people? It was severely lacking. So after I wrote that book, I had talked to my publisher and said, I really wanted to write about the most underrepresented African Americans. And to me, that was black women. I have to tell you something. Uh, you don't know this. I don't know if my producer told you this. I don't think he did. But you are part of the inspiration for this show today. And I'm going to tell you why. I live in Los Angeles. I know who Biddy Mason is. And I became really fascinated with her uh, a little while ago. I'm going to let you tell my audience more about her because you'll do it better. But um, I was looking for books about her. I mean, I could not believe that someone who was born enslaved and ended up one of Los Angeles's biggest landowners didn't have more written about her. Your book was one of the books that one of the few, frankly, I found that uh, gave some sense of her life and who she was. And from your book, I became more interested in this notion of all these other uh, Black folks in, in the Old West who no one seems to know about. So with all of that, I will ask you, uh, tell us a little bit about one of my heroes, uh, Biddy Mason. She's in chapter one of Trisha Wagner's book, African American Women in the Old uh, in the Old West. And we're going to talk about your other book, Black Men in the Old West, uh, a little bit after this. But tell us a little bit about Biddy. All right. Well, you know, well, as I said, it was hard to uncover information about her. So I had to go to a lot of primary source uh, documents, you know, marriage, birth, death certificates, uh, census records, you know, oral histories that had been written down and old journals and, you know, such like that. Biddy Mason is a very interesting woman. I tell you, this woman was made of steel. She, when she was 18 years old, she was given away as a wedding present from her master to her master's cousin. And if you could only imagine her getting all her, when her master came and said, get ready, get dressed, here's a new dress, get ready, be on the porch of the plantation. And she's all excited. She's excused from her work. She comes in, she's standing there just waiting. And here comes this carriage all the way down the road and out comes a cousin and her husband. And he takes Biddy by the shoulders and he thrusts her in, into her and says, here, your wedding present. And you can just, I, I, my heart just absolutely broke for her knowing that here she was hoping that something special, maybe some privilege or something was going to happen. And she was given away. She was just given away like a piece of property. And, and it just really struck a chord with me. It's just the injustice of, of how people are treated is just phenomenal. You wrote about, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I must only because uh, when I read that part of the story in your book, of, of Biddy's story, you capture it so beautifully. I mean, you, you know, one of the things that I think that people often don't do when they write about enslaved African Americans is that they forget the humanity. And you describe a young girl getting dressed up for a special day, thinking something special is going to happen, uh, and she's just being sold like a, like a piece of property. Tell us more about Biddy. So then she moved away with her master and eventually she had three children through her uh, master because obviously that happened quite a bit. She and her children and her uh, sister and I think another uh, slave were moved uh, west and they went to California. But California had been admitted to the Union as a free state in 1850. So when she met other free blacks out there, they encouraged her to fight for her freedom. And she eventually decided that she was going to do that. And you can try to think about how, how scary that was for a woman. She was 33 at, at that state. And what is she going to do? She's not literate. She can't read. She can't write. By law, she is not allowed to testify in a court for herself at all. And she had to absolutely have trust, implicit trust in her attorney that he would do the best job for her 
and she went up against him and the decision came down that she was free. But I can't even imagine what courage it took for her to go up against someone because what would happen if she didn't win? Oh. Then she'd go back to the clutches right. of the the master who was enslaving her. And, and I think it's important, I don't wanna give short shrift to a point that you just made, uh, people should be reminded of the fact that at the time when Biddy Mason was suing for her freedom, black folks, Asian folks, anybody who was not white was not allowed to testify in court. Maybe not at all, Trisha, or maybe certainly not against white people. Like you could not give evidence or testimony against a white person. Absolutely. You had to sit silent, if you can imagine. You couldn't even explain or defend or say anything. So anything she told her attorney, he could use. But what if she wanted some other point to be made? She better hope that her attorney had all that down pat because she could not open her mouth one iota. So yet and still, she manages somehow to become free. How does it happen? The judge listened to the whole situation, listened to all the facts back and forth. The slave owner was erroneously holding those slaves against their will. It was not the law that he could hold them. He was very brazen. He thought that he would never be taken to court and that he just thought that, uh, you know, he held all the power and, and he would get his way. And I, he was stunned when, when it happened that he, he didn't and uh, he lost and she and her family walked out of that courtroom, free people. And like you said, she went on to be a good business person, uh, very wise, great decisions, land holdings, one of the wealthier people in Los Angeles at the time. In fact, her son became, I think, one of the wealthiest black Americans in, in Los Angeles. And she was a philanthropist, well-known, generous to everybody, to a fault. She was just an amazing, amazing woman. And her lands were at the center of uh, Los Angeles, so she was uh, got a lot of money for her land. <laughs> One of the first black women to own land in Los Angeles and one of the founders of the first AME church, African Methodist Episcopalian Church, which uh, is still a, a thriving congregation to this day. Uh, tell us about some of the other women in your book, Tricia. How about Clara Brown? Now, this is someone that really speaks to every mother out there. Clara Brown, when the type of prejudice that she experienced was being made to feel inferior and the most extreme lack of empathy you ever could have for another human being, when she and her family were sold like animals on the auction block. And her child was literally ripped from her arms, taken away, put in a cart, and, and whisked away. And the heartache, you cannot imagine that. You just cannot imagine. All of her family was sold off. And she tried for years. Clara tried for years to keep in touch with her family. And she could as best as she could to hear about who, you know, went where. But she lost touch with that young little girl that was torn from her. And she spent the entire rest of her life trying to find her. She, even when she was freed, she went to Colorado when the gold mining or the silver mining was so big out there, thinking, well, perhaps she went you know, and ended up there. And that was that was her goal for her entire life is to be reunited with her daughter. And I am thrilled to tell the end of the story because it needs to be told. She she did find her. I love a happy ending. Yeah. So given the racial pressures and racial terrorism uh, that so many African Americans were facing in other parts of the country during this period, was there some relative benefit to the the lawlessness, if that's an appropriate way of describing it, of the Old West. I mean, you know, when I think about the Old West, I think about a place where the sheriff would be loosely involved if things got mm -hmm. too out of hand, but that people mostly kind of had their guns and minded their own business with their weapons. One, is that kind of accurate? And two, if it is, did that culture benefit Black folks who were trying to flee uh, the restrictions of Jim Crow and other racist laws? Well, I would say that West certainly offered opportunity more than any other place in the country at that time. We're talking about 1840s, 1850s, 60s, so you know, slaves were freed 1865. But the opportunities were more plentiful in the West and upward uh, mobility was more available in the West until racial prejudice moved West. In other words, when Easterners starting to move West, they brought their prejudices with them. Because what is prejudice but a, you know, a distrust or a dislike for those unlike ourselves, right? And it's a fear of losing something 
maybe such as one's status or privilege or position. And what happened is when more people moved west, when black people moved west and they experienced the joys of not being so restricted, that was great until white people started moving west and they brought those prejudices with them because they didn't want to have the, the, anyone to have the equal standing to their own. And when, they, when people feel like a lesser group of individuals is gaining your same status, well, then they want to prevent racial and social uplift. And that's exactly what started to happen. So they kind of imported the exclusionary norms of back east and down south and brought them out west, is what you're saying. Yes, they did. There's a woman, Annie Box Neal, who had an unbelievable uh, hotel and health sanitarium out in Oracle, Arizona. And uh, this was world renowned. I mean, she was a, a, an incredible uh, a woman who, who had presidents from the United States, people from coming from around the world, stay at this fabulous place, a uh, resort up in the mountains. And she was generous and donated money and uh, uh, to causes and charities. And eventually when people started moving and settling in that town, she started being excluded. They still wanted people, to, they still wanted her to donate to this cause and that charitable cause. But they weren't invited. The women were not inviting her to their parties anymore. They weren't. They weren't including her at all. So she she's lost all her social standing. Yeah, you know, Trisha, I wonder if uh, that doesn't really explain my next question because I was going to ask you, why don't we know these stories? I mean, frankly, it is surprising to me as an African American woman who grew up in Los Angeles that the story of Biddy Mason is not told in every school uh, in the area, you know, that there aren't Biddy Mason schools all over the country. I mean, if you think about what story, what is more quintessentially American mm -hmm. <laughs> than coming from that situation, being enslaved and dying one of a growing cities, LA at the time was a growing city, uh, one of its biggest landowners and endowing that, th that, that type of wealth. So. I wonder, why don't we hear those stories? And then I, uh, I'll ask you, do you think it's because of, you know, the sort of importation of racism that you just described, that they were kind of systematically excluded from the tale of how the West was won, uh, so to speak? Yes, I do. I, I think that Black women had gender and race going against them. You know, historians have ignored the contributions and achievements that women have made throughout history. And why? Well, I think history mirrors that white male perspective. They were the ones that were writing history, correct? And the writers of the history are the ones that make history. And that's why I am so thrilled to write my books, because I am actually helping to change the situation. I am, when I go out and speak at schools or I speak at conferences, I am helping to tell the story that needs to be told. When you think about it, the elitist attitude of the European white male landowners from a long time ago, they came over and settled this country. They held all the rights and all the power. And I feel like we've been trying to eke that power away from them forever. Black men got the right to vote, you know, in 1870, finally. Well, it was another 50 years before women got the right to vote. Not until 1920. I mean, why does it take so long to get the same rights and privileges? I, I That just blows my mind. I mean, when you think about it, a nation's history written solely about the contributions of women while excluding the men would be equally ludicrous. <laughs> I mean, where do we fit in? I mean, it took a combined effort to make a living on the frontier. You know, a lot of sweat equity went into settling a community and having some semblance of civilization. And what women did, particularly black women, what they did that was so different from the men in settling the West was that they were truly concerned, generally concerned about the general uplift of their race. And they knew that to accomplish this, they had to have a sense of community. They needed to reform and refine their society. And they knew no town was ever gonna grow until we had schools and churches and organizations and fostered some sense of community. And the black female is a very strong individual has a very familial, strong family bond, nothing will deter her from making it better for the next generation. And that's exactly what the black women did. Let's talk about specifically some of the sorts of things that these women did do because uh, they're still operating in the confines of a culture and a structure that treats women as second class, that assumed women couldn't do 
uh, certain types of things. But as you pointed out, their work and the work of these, uh, the African American women who you write about and others was critical to building the West. What sorts of work were these black women engaged in? What kinds of things were they doing? Susie Revels Caton was a uh, free woman. She was a journalist and she was a civil and social activist out, uh, out West in Seattle. And she was a very prominent, uh, wealthy woman. She and her husband started the Seattle Republican newspaper. And it had a, had a white and black readership. It was very popular, uh, very well received. Once they start, she and her husband started to tackle uh, issues, that are sensitive, uh, racially sensitive issues, such as lynchings in the country, raping of black women. Businesses started pulling their advertisements and subscriptions decreased. And after a 19 year run, they had to close their magazine. And Susie and her family, because more people started working out there, uh, lost their standing. They were accused of having the neighborhood's real estate value depreciate. I mean, this is one of the most prominent people in all of Seattle. People were just ma made them feel, you know, inferior. And her husband, uh, Horace, uh, lost a legal battle because he refused uh, service in a restaurant in Seattle and he took it to court and he lost. I mean, Everything, it's just like that. I can only explain it as like the tide began to turn. The more white people came out and brought their prejudices with them, the tide started to turn. But what I give credit to is that no one sat back and took it. People thought, you know what, education is the key, hard work is the key. We're going to make it better for the next generation. And what, what takes one woman down empowers another. And a trailblazer, you know, they just refused to be defeated. And a lot of these women didn't plan on becoming, you know, trailblazers. That was that was not their goal, but they certainly were. And they, by doing so, they opened doors of opportunity for countless others that came behind them and educated other people of other races that this is this is not will not be tolerated. What were some of the ways, Tricia, that they fought back? Taking care of their own. Uh, Elizabeth Thorne Scott Flood. She was an educator and a social activist. She was a free black woman. Uh, she opened her first private colored school, it was called, uh, in her own home in 1854 because blacks and minorities were not allowed in the public schools in California. And her pupils ranged from age four to 29. You know, she, everybody, everyone just had such a value on education because that's how you got respect and that's how you move forward. But and then she when she moved to Oakland, she had opened the first uh, private black school there in her home in 1857. And why was this? Because black communities had to pay taxes for the public schools, but their children were barred from going to them. They had to pay private tuition. So they had, they had to work twice as hard, you know, 10 times as hard, whatever. And there was just a real lack of respect for education. And, and that she, she's called the mother of education in California because she did so much to change that. So I, I guess I would have to say activism in a word. It was activism. Everybody said, I can do this, and they did. Let's talk about another of your books, Black Cowboys of the <laughs> Old West. Again, certainly Black people as a whole uh, have been excluded from history. You focused on women in uh, African-American women of the Old West. Why the focus here on Black Cowboys? If I can go back just a second to, um, so African-American, and women of, my old, of the Old West was my second book. My third book was, it's called It Happened on the Underground Railroad, because I was thinking what in the world was happening while well, some people were moving west, blacks were moving west, where were most blacks? Well, they were enslaved in the southeast. So I wrote that book. And then when I was done with that, I thought, well, who else is really missing from history? And I thought, oh my goodness, it's the cowboys. Where were the black cowboys? And so I became so engrossed in that topic and did so much research. I will say that was easier to find. Why? Because it's a male. Uh, we could find more you know, history on males than we could on females. It's just unfortunately, a lot of people just didn't feel like the contributions and achievements of women were important enough to record. So that's why it was lacking. So with black cowboys, they were just missing. There was a conspicuous absence in the, in the American cattle and ranching industry. And I know they were there. Tell us about some of them, because, you know, of course they were there. I always find it so interesting when, you know, people assume that black people were kind of born into slavery and then disappeared until somewhere around the moment that Barack Obama <laughs> 
<laughs> arrived on the scene. Um, tell us about some of these uh, incredible figures who not enough people know about, frankly. Tell us who they were. You can start with uh, Bill Pickett. Bill Pickett was a free black man, and he was a legend in his own time. He was one of the greatest rodeo entertainers. And he invented this uh, system of bulldogging. And bulldogging is when you're kind of wrestling the steer and getting them to the ground, which is, you know, a very, uh, oh, gosh, people just love to go to the rodeos and, and watch that. But he had a very unique way of doing this, Tanya. What he did is he would throw a steer with his teeth. So he would ride the uh, horse, jump off the horse onto the bull, take the bull by the hands, twist it around until his face was right in front of the bull, and then he would bite the upper snotty lip of that bull with his teeth. Now, can you imagine how scary that was to be face to face with a raging bull? And then how gross it is to bite onto that lip. But he would do it. If you've ever bitten your lip, you know how hard that, that hurts, right? So imagine him taking his teeth and biting as hard as he can onto the face of that bull, and that bull would flip over, and Bill Pickett would put his arms and legs up in the air, and he had just, like, you know, took taken this bull down with his teeth. I mean, the crowds would just go crazy. And he was just a legend in his own time. He was just the star attraction of all the shows. Was it easier for black men to get work as cowboys than in other sorts of jobs? I mean, was it a profession? Was it a job that was relatively open to them? Yes, it was. Especially if you had any experience with um, cows and cattle and that type of a thing. Because during the Civil War, uh, the cattle population in Texas just uh, multiplied exponentially. Uh, people either fighting away, uh, men were fighting away the Indians or some of the Civil War. Uh, so there was just a, the surplus of cows. So then there became this big demand for beef up, up north and out east. So the cattle had to be driven on these uh, cattle drives all the way up there. So they needed cowboys. And so cowboys, uh, black cowboys were allowed to um, participate in that. And black cowboys, they played a vital role in settling the West on the long cattle drives, the, the lucrative ranching business, and also just the taming of the Old West. Prior to the period where there was more, uh, where there was a greater influx of folks coming from the East and the South uh, who were bringing their uh, bigotry with them, prior to that, was there more social acceptance you know, for uh, black men at this time? And I'm saying men specifically. So if you're a cowboy, you know, you're out there rustling up the herd with all the other guys. If you're able to wrestle a bull to the ground and bite its nose, uh, which is something that not even the other guys, uh, you know, the, the, a lot of the other guys were doing, did that allow for more uh, social and, and cultural acceptance uh, of black men during the time? Yes, it did. They, there was a great equality, a greater equality among cowboys, I would say, um, between the races uh, until his, uh, black man became a, um, a foreman or a boss. Uh, the white cowboys didn't want to take orders from them. But if they had the same jobs, then, then they were treated as equals. In cowboyhood, uh, there is a hierarchy you know, of the jobs. Uh, they have the wranglers and the riders and the ropers. And, and then you could escalate, you know, move up to being a, a cook or a trail boss or a foreman. Uh, those were very coveted positions and they held equal status. But uh, it's very rare that a cowboy became a, that had the apex of the career, which would be a ranch owner. Explain how important you think these opportunities in the West were to black people at the time. I mean, you know, I, I've got family who was originally born in Mississippi people moved west. You know, the Great Migration was about leaving uh, some of the racial terrors of, of the South. How important was the West and was the frontier uh, to African Americans? I think it was everything to many because it showed that there was uh, opportunity and there was chance for improvement. There was chance for independence. There was less discrimination. Uh, there was opportunities to settle and have a family and live a re relatively unfettered life. And that was huge. Who doesn't want that for their family and their loved ones, right? So people went in droves out, out, out there. Who doesn't? Uh, you know, but before I let you go, again, I am so grateful uh, that you've done this work and do this writing. How can we do a better job of teaching history? And when I say we, I mean, you know, me, us as a community of Americans who really need to make sure that we all know all of our stories. I mean, goodness, we've now so politicized 
telling other people's stories. People are almost afraid, it seems now, not to whitewash history. But I think the work you've done shows if we tell the whole truth, it really is instructive. I mean, it can provide hope for so many more of us. You know, if, if more people today knew what Biddy Mason lived and how she overcame, I, I think that that's a way of, of imparting hope. How can we do a better job? I mean, look, there are only so many hours in the day. You can only write so many books. How can we make sure that these stories are, are shared more broadly? The truth has to be told and the tough discussions have to be held. We have to be open and receptive of hearing that things were wrong and things need to be righted. Uh, I think that obviously we've come so far. Do we have a lot farther to go? Of course. But it's important to teach of anybody the most important resource we have in this whole country who are our children. We must teach our children. I have the saying that we say you have to see it to be it. You know, children need to see themselves in the story. They need to see role models from their own race. They know that they can accomplish great things and don't have to you know, succumb to social, you know, societal limitations if they can see themselves in the story. If they can identify with the character in the book, then I think then they can be inspired to you know, reach their own goals. You know, it's interesting. There was a, a black um, historian, Paul Stewart, and he read about black cowboys in Western uh, fiction all the time in the 1930s. And he never knew, as amazes me, he never knew there was such a thing as a black cowboy until he saw one as a, as a, a child in Denver, Colorado, because all the books were white, 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 white. And so 40 years later, he opened the Black American Western Museum and Heritage Center in Denver. So it's important for children to see. And I think that we start with our children and we work our way up. It's critical that they see it. Uh, and again, it's critical that folks like you keep doing this work uh, because there are stories to be told that we're just not hearing and it's time to hear more. So thank you, Trisha Martineau Wagner. I hope you will come back. Uh, Trisha's books, African American Women of the Old West, Black Cowboys of the Old West. It happened on the Underground Railroad and it happened on the Oregon Trail. Trisha Martineau Wagner, thanks for being here today. Thank you.